Whatever it was. <laughs> I said, well, all right, we will go to item number. Reconsideration of Resolution 2020-61, Acquisition of Real Property. I will ask David Engelbert to start that one. Okay, I have uh, made the request to the Chairman Lino to have this placed on the agenda. I was hoping at the last meeting that I would have been present to lead some discussion on the project, on the financing of it, what had gone to uh, the finance committee. I was unable to attend that meeting, so I've asked for the reconsideration. Uh, should I make the motion to reconsider yes. or give some reason? That would be appropriate if you make the motion to reconsider. Okay, I would like to make the motion to reconsider the purchase of property on the Washington Island resolution of whatever the number is, I'm sure, 2020 is 61. Is there a second to the motion? District 19 seconds. Randy, and Scott, I guess uh, going back to the, to the, I go back historically, but going back to even the finance committee meeting, uh, the administrator kind of recommended that the facilities committee had approved of the project and you know, as it was being presented, and that uh, it could be sent on the county board for discussion here. The financing was a recommendation to take money from reserves to, to balance the request. At that meeting, I asked that the, the, the study of the EMS facilities in 2015 they should be provided to all board members so that they have an understanding of the EMS operations. That seems to be something I've asked that public safety. And then again, at finance was reflected in the meeting. The minutes, it was first to a month later, had the request of facility, but that was provided to us. That talks about uh, the new station here in Sturgeon Bay, the station at Tubbs, and the station at Jacksonport, and how those fit into the, to the programs for EMS. Uh, the island project seems to get booted up with the request from the from the town to relocate the garage or a heavy garage to house the, the ambulances. Uh, first, it was an eight hundred thousand dollar request. It was reduced at public safety to five hundred thousand. The eight hundred thousand amount came from the public station. It was an estimated cost for their construction that was just completed a couple of years ago. That study indicates, I think all of you should see the copy of it now, indicates that the need for a station down at Russell's, perhaps a need for one in the Jacksonport Egg Harbor area. Once the North, North Station or the Central Station here is completed, which it has been, and how that all fits into the operations and coverage of the county. Uh, there, there were the north when the north station was constructed 20 years ago. I chaired that building committee. We worked with the village of Sister Bay, worked and built a building on the village's land with a lease and shared costs. That model was used at Brussels. The ambulance station there was built. On land, the three pounds I purchased at a site that the county was agreeable to. Move forward to the island project, and it seems the first it was to be a joint project with the fire department on the island and the EMS. And then we're told that they couldn't afford to, to go ahead with the project if we could proceed to do something on our own. The project grew from an ambulance station to perhaps offering other services that we have not done for other municipalities in the county. It expanded from, say, 500000 to now a $1.8 million project. This action had approved the 800000 but through the CIP, 
is actually 1.8 million that we'd be using a million dollars in reserve to cover the cost of this project. I wish we had done more, and I do chair finance, but I certainly blame myself. But I think we needed to have more discussion there as to the use of reserve funds for this project. As has been reported to us at other meetings, we have the for the Avenue Lab, uh, project, the library, so many areas where money might be spent. And are we setting some kind of precedent here using reserve funds when not considering all the other things that are going on within the within the county? Uh, going back to that study, you know that the South Station serves three towns probably four times the population and three times the falls. Yet I don't think we uh, public safety, maybe facilities have looked at how will the building must be used and how fits into our overall operations and which areas are more important. Again, going back to doing the new station here in Sturgeon Bay and the boat station and see how EMS operations work after that. And then how the uh, staffing of that of those facilities gets in. We had several couple of special county board meetings talked about our budget shortfalls, where we'll have trouble finding money for it. for certain projects. We don't know that we've really gotten an operations cost. The facility on the island that has been proposed. Yeah, we've listened to presentations on taking protected service away from county jailers. We've had a couple of meetings on the transportation facility because we can't afford to continue that program maybe as it was operating. And yet we can move this project up, expand it. And use reserve funds to, to finance it to begin with. I just can't really understand how we can go from a garage and storage area for two ambulances to a $1.8 million project. We have our constituents to consider to face with higher taxes in every area. From schools all asking for referendums for bigger ex expansion and operation costs. And yet we're looking to use reserves when perhaps we have excess reserves that can certainly be argued. But we're at a time when with COVID virus or <clears throat> through what's presented at finance, our estimate on sales tax will be down considerably. Either started all okay because it reflects back to last fall's taxes that were received. But the last months have been running. Thirty to forty thousand dollars less. Interest rates have plummeted. We're probably anticipating two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars less interest income this year, and probably more next year because those rates will reflect the whole year versus what's down now. So there's a lot of questions about where we're spending, but certainly to go back as we're looking at buying land, put up a EMS building. That we haven't done in other areas of the county. So offering or pursuing using some of those facilities that we don't provide basically in the other municipalities. And then certainly a funding of the CIP is an important project, an important planning document. But when we put a dollar amount into it, it's sometimes a best guess. Or in this case, it was the well, less that we spent in Brussels, let's put that as a as a starting point. So that's some of my reasons for asking for reconsideration. I have to expand on some of those. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, it says I'm not I'm number one on the I'm sorry. I'm not used to looking at the screen again. Right. Yes, Biz. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think everybody in this room probably received emails 
from individuals on Washington Island. I, I, I didn't count how many, but I, there was at least a dozen, 15, maybe more, that are all against uh, the acquisition of this property. And uh, I, I think the individual that spoke at public comment hit the nail exactly right on the head. He said that that if we built a, a, a building on that 10 acres, we could provide plenty of room for when Washington Island can afford a fire station and put the fire station with the AMS where it belongs. And that, that he said, he, he commented on sharing the well, sharing, you know, sharing everything that, that's in place. And even if they can't, the fire station, department can't build now, there would be room for them to, to add on to our building and, and have them together. So I uh, I wasn't going to be in support of this resolution. I'm glad there, that uh, David's making the amendment. Uh, I, I think we should be looking at building a, a, a building from scratch on vacant land and uh, not, not be trying to rehab this building and make it work uh, as an EMS and, and uh, I, I think all these people on the island that are saying, you know, I didn't see a single one for it. They were, they were all negative, saying, please reconsider this, this, this thing. And, and uh, uh, I, I know they've been told us to vacate up there, and I, I, think, I think there's just more time available to rethink this whole thing out, and that uh, uh, we should not, not go with this resolution the way it's written right now. I agree with most of what, what uh, David Engelbert said, and uh, I'm not on the finance committee anymore. But but uh, uh, you know that, that that's my viewpoint on it. Thank you. All right. Hi. Uh, so a couple couple comments, uh, especially some of the messages that we heard today. So for, for the request for the reason to dislay, de delay this action is because of a, of a cautionary. I am generally concerned with where building costs are just in the last six months, if you look at the cost of a two by four, but from two bucks to almost six bucks. These numbers that we're looking at from Samuelson Group was from April of 2020. Building costs are skyrocketing. I don't see in the future as trying to be a supervisor and be a visionary that we're going to get a better deal than this. So uh, going into these talks already a couple of years back, yes, I would love to see that there's a partnership and collaboration of financial costs with going into an emergency service building. Um, a half a mile wedge, as was spoke about in the public meeting, I, I don't think that's a deal breaker. Uh, I do believe that there is collaboration that can still happen. There was visions with that on the on the layouts and information has come forward as fire to be uh, to be connected with them. I do I do understand the reason for the motion coming forward with the cautionary and where we're at, you know, the COVID costs. We're really not down that much, only thirty to forty thousand from uh, sales revenue from last year. I am generally concerned if we postpone this, this will be years before this comes up again. Since 2014, our emergency director has been supporting this purchase, or excuse me, supporting the movement there. I'm surprised that if we had an ad hoc meeting or report for emergency services that our emergency service director would be here to say those words and talk about that information versus just having a letter in our packet. I think this is a very important decision for emergency services or our county going forward. But I did get the information in our packet that says that this is continued support. So even though we did a study from years ago, that letter has been put in our in our packet that our emergency service director, our department head for that sector, is still supporting this to move forward. Um, I, I am if we if we look at the building fresh and hope that then Washington Island can then support financially going forward. I just don't see that happening anytime soon. And I do believe just where costs are at right now, the cost of real estate and how it's skyrocketing, we're going to be going there. I don't believe that there is, is a reason to delay this action. So therefore, I believe we should should take act, action on this. I think it's a very good purchase. I think it's community-minded. We took a tour on that island. Members of the council for Washington Island were present. 
and told us that this is what the community wanted and they were speaking on behalf of the community. We did receive a few emails. I received about 10. I did reply to those emails. I did not get I did not get only one reply back when I was rebutting some of the comments that were made and said that we already filtered out over the last couple of years. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Susan? Um, I just wanted to comment on a couple of the concerns. I, I don't think there's anything substantially different from when we voted on this before. Um, first of all, we have an obligation to serve the people of the island. It would be nice if they were the exactly the same population as other areas so that we that that was more of an equal basis for serving but they're not it's the reality of of the demographics but that doesn't mean we shouldn't serve them um with regard to are we doing more than we're doing to above our sister bay i believe and ken can correct me if i'm wrong but we put the same things in bugs so that our sheriff's department and our human services would have offices there. This Sister Bay, I believe, has a place where our sheriff and our human services can work. The only thing different on the island is that there are the sleeping places because, of course, it's a longer distance. It sometimes could be an overnight, especially in the winter, with very scheduled and conditions. So we're not really doing anything different in terms of serving departments or allowing departments to serve citizens at Washington Island that we're doing for Bug or Sister Bay. Um, I appreciate that there are concerns on the island, but I think all of us who have been with this project, watching it ever since it began, and you see that in the minutes, that was very, very helpful to see how far back this goes. And we see that we tried to take advantage of the offered um, parcel. It didn't work because of an inability to have it to have it work with what we could accept in terms of that donation. Um, the, the it was the um, town that asked us to leave. It's not that we are trying to leave the fire department. And if you look on the site plans of both the opportunity to build a new one or the, the dairy, there is a place for the department to build their facility when they're ready to do so in both of them. And, and in that case, they'll be close again. Um, I definitely think Laura is right when she says that building costs are not going to get easier. We've watched a bunch of buildings that we have tried to do as projects in the last couple of years, and the sticker shot is terrible because of the costs going up. Um, People are concerned about the historical nature of that building. You know, the, the gentleman is offered to sell it. So if we were not to buy it, he may sell it to someone else. So I don't think, I'm, I'm sorry for their concerns, but I do think we have vetted those kinds of concerns in trying to deal with this project. And I don't really see anything different. I, In fact, our administrator, I believe, had to go out and negotiate this process and was fair fairly far along on it when this change happened. So I think we just need to go ahead and do it. Thank you, Susan. Vinny? I agree with Supervisor Pohuk's comments and had many of the same, which I won't repeat. <laughs> Except for I do think that I also received about 10 emails and I think, and I appreciate hearing how people feel, how those people feel. But I think that that doesn't represent the entire community, and I think we cannot know the kind of services that are needed on the island based on the response that we received in the last couple of days, and that this has been a need in the community and has been a need in the county for many years and has been worked on for many years. So I think we can't lose sight of that when there are some somewhat knee-jerk reactions at the last minute. I just say that meaning that they were coming in so late in the game to a long process that has been well underway. I think that's a, a pretty important point. I would like clarification um, for the board on the costs of each of these actions because some of the comments and concerns I'm hearing sound that sound like it will be more expensive to renovate the dairy uh, land building where it seems that that is the more affordable cost for what we get. So if you could clarify that, it would help. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take a, a second just to clarify just a few items. 
And again, just after the training, I've been serving your plunger, so I'm not advocating in one, any one way or direction or anything. <laughs> but you did give me a task, and I got you down this path, so I'm going to advocate down this path for right now. But a couple things. This, uh, the comments, and I guess we're active on Facebook, and I and I know the timing's off. I am planning to work with Joel to go to the island to get facts out there. But a lot of the emails that we're dealing with is based off, in my situation, not in my backyard. There's been uh, Facebook posts that put a lot of false information. I'm trying to work with Joel to get that information corrected. But again, the power of Facebook and putting a lot of things saying that we're going to tear down or destroy the historic nature of the building. I got emails on that. They said that there's flooding inside the building. That's not true, but now people are saying the building's flooding. So it's kind of hard to react as fast as Facebook and the social media and the emails you're getting. But I can tell you a lot of those issues that have been in those emails have been items that we have discussed or reviewed or discussed at our in our last meeting. In terms of the cost, again, that's one of those things too, where again, the facts are not being conveyed, but yes, the existing building is the cheapest option for us in terms of moving forward. In terms of that, again, the estimated cost was about 1.85 million under the existing option. That gives us the full expansion as our, I guess, the preferred design. Likewise, as it's been mentioned multiple times, it does allow for future cooperation with the town. And I guess we were all in attendance with the town when we went for the tour. The town, and Joel can reiterate, but the town has been part of this process throughout, and they will still be a future partner if they choose to do so in the future, in my mind. Um, again, we did look at uh, this in terms of cost, because I want to answer everybody's questions. Again, the uh, $1.85 million for that, the new building on that 10-acre piece was projected at $2.5 million. And then again, there was concern, uh, again, that we had gone out of scope or made this too big out of scope, so we scaled back and took everything back in terms of the conference rooms and the training rooms and stuff like that. We're still at a price tag of about 1.45. This because of new construction costs. Again, this is the way the market is right now. And also, if we go there, bathrooms, two septics, that's all there. And those are the costs that we worked through with the consultant. So again, not... And I'm advocating in one sense, but I also am sure it's your pleasure. But I do think we did a lot, a lot of work to get to this point. And I guess I'd hate to have a Facebook post kind of destroy all that progress. But I think it's worthwhile to discuss and answer those questions that we are comfortable moving forward. And as I mentioned before, I will be going to the island with Joel to do a presentation to, I guess, share those concerns and try to answer those questions. Uh, but again, I guess... I know Aaron's in the other room. I know Wayne is also there and myself from a staff standpoint. I do think we've done all of our due diligence and I still stand before you recommending that I do think that this is the most cost effective option in terms of moving forward for us to provide not only EMS services, but other services. And I think that's the one thing that's also thrown a whole bunch of people off is that this was just not go back to 2015, that study prompted that initial thing of this yes. But that quickly changed. I handed all that information out that we're looking at a building that provides multiple uses besides just ES. And that's been our target since I think 2016 and all that information that I provided to you last month in our discussion. So I'll leave it at that. I can answer more questions. Um, Lisa? Everyone can hear me, I assume? Yes. Okay. Um, so I have a one one quick question and kind of an observation. So my one quick question is, when officially do we have to have the ambulances out of the current place that they are in? Like, what's the date officially? The town is not, <clears throat> the original process when we met with the town and had that discussion, we did the joint resolutions was a year when we had those discussions, but there's nothing that's kicking us out of the building. So there's no formal timeline. The town's been very proactive. And again, I still think we're very strong partners in us moving forward in that. So that's been the stance today. Okay. And my other thing was originally it's, I was going to ask a question, but you kind of answered it with your, your statement previously. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, it, it, since I live in Sturgeon Bay, it could be just that I'm too far south now to get the emails from the island as much. Um, but I don't remember a year ago when we did the fun bus ride with Joel, 
um, looking around the island and stuff like that, I don't remember getting more than maybe one or two emails about this entire topic the entire time, um, I, you know, when we when we did this last summer. Um, you know, and you kind of answered it that there was a Facebook post and that's why there's now sudden sudden interest in it and stuff like that. But I, you know, and maybe people did get emails I didn't get, you know, depending on what part of the county you're in. But I honestly do not remember getting more than maybe one or two emails, you know, when we did this, when we actually vote on the resolution. Thank you, Lisa. Susan? Yeah, one other quick thing. Um, I, I, it's reflected, I think, in the emails, but with regard to the ad hoc committee, um, I believe from my experience on that committee and also having served on public what was then EMS um, committee. We always knew while we were doing the ad hoc committee that, that, that Washington Island was kind of looking at that they were gonna have to do something at some point. They knew space was starting to become a problem and there were, there were issues. They didn't know where they were going at that point. But So this is not a surprise that at some point they came to the conclusion that they had to ask us to leave so they could do whatever. So I guess what I all my, my point was that ad hoc committee, the fact that it didn't recommend us doing a specific thing doesn't mean that we didn't kind of know something was coming down the line. And that's you know a while ago. That's all I got. I just wanted to add one other quick point is which was a concern in the emails is about the space being able to be used by the community. I know when we toured it last summer, that was a discussion we had as well, is that some of that open space, especially in the upstairs part, could still be used for community events and as a community gathering space, which is really something that adds value to any community. And I think that was maybe perceived as being taken away. So I just wanted to clarify that that was originally what we discussed. Thank you. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've received 12 emails on this topic, and all of them are in opposition. Um, and again, all just this week. Um, I was just hoping for a little clarification on the suggestion from Mr. McLaren about the land donation. Can you just remind me, um, you know, was there something about the land donation that didn't work for us? Or is, is that any bit of a hurdle for us? Please remind me about the land, potential land donation. Thank you. Sure. So Grant can back me up on this. I'll do the short version. Short version is that we never reached terms because he had changing criteria in terms of what he would do in terms of the donation itself. It got to a certain point where we, I guess, held off the negotiations and that's when we were approached also on the Island Dairy. We had worked with Mr. McLaren and said that we would, I guess, continue negotiations should we want to pursue it. Uh, again, so again, the offer is still there. We have the email saying that it's still there, but he also says there's no conditions, but also finishes off the memo with his conditions at the bottom of the memo. And that's the same issue that Grant has gone over time and time again. So when we even discussed it at facilities and parks, we just got to the point that we can just buy the land for the $75,000 and then that way we have full control of what we're gonna do with no conditions. And that's why we will potentially that price into the analysis, whether it's donation or purchase at 75, it's still more cost feasible to, again, go with the dairy. I don't know, Grant, if you want to add anything, but I think that sums it up. Yeah, that sums it up. But I think what we have to remember is we're kind of creating some false issues or questions here uh, because the comparison that was done by the outside engineering firm did a price comparison and the historic question item dairy is still the least expensive option. Uh, as between the two, uh, but but Ken's right. We were never able to actually reach a, a, an agreement. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily all that important in this debate. If we're just comparing the relative cost of building new versus renovation of an existing building. Laura, yeah. thanks. You just want, I just wanted to add that. You know, there's been comments that have been said too in the last year or two about an island. You know, the island is part of the county. And sometimes having an island as part of your county costs more money. It just, it is what it is. If you got to take a boat to get there, um, it can cost more expensive. Building on an island is going to cost more expensive than building in, building in the other part of the county. Um, on page 19 of our packet, that is a list of collaboration. 
of between a request through all the departments that we have in our county that was compiled together on what their needs are or need to be or have been had requests over the years through our other departments. So this is not just emergency services. Uh, we're speaking about health and human services when the public nurse, nurse goes up to the island every month that there's privacy for patients when they see people, not into a larger area. They actually have a private room. So that's, that is an important aspect too. Um, so I, I think that, that it was a well said uh, comment also from another supervisor. When we went to that island and seeing the beautiful renovation that has been done with that, the seeing that as a future part of their community, possible public library, possible event. So let's let's uh, continue with what all the hard work of the years that we put into this, and hope that uh, that that area can get more fiscally sound, that they can contribute more and be part more of this building. So thank you. David? Yes, uh, I guess the, the comment back to some of these, the idea that the costs are up right now since since uh, April, certainly they have been. That's not a guarantee they're not going back down. Hopefully they will. The cost that everyone's looking at for construction, you may be a lot down, but it's really, uh, you talk about here, that's what we're looking at here in that case. Let's spend it, let's do it now because it's going to cost more next month here. And we're not sure that's the way it is. We've had cycles in construction up and down before. Uh, when I reference the use of the building for other purposes, I get to come back that it's the sheriff's department or it's human services. How about all the space in that building that we're saying, well, it could be used for a meal site or maybe it's just rumor, but it could be used for a library. Other communities are provided building space or a site for those facilities. I've been around this county board for a long time, good or bad. I can go back to, gosh, I don't know when it was, in the 90s. And we used to have a bookmobile service throughout the county. And that was in. And I said, what about Southern North? We have one branch there. Every village up north has one, including the islands. Well, if you have a site, we can provide a branch. We can do that. But finally, the county union purchased a building. I asked Nancy Rubler to bring it to the library committee. You know, there's a room there that some of the residents in the town have tried to start a library. It's only open a couple of days, it's donated books. And the response I got back from Nancy, that didn't follow all the channels, was pretty much the library committee says, we don't have money to do anything. I thought maybe we could even do something with communications and how archives, something we could connect to the system. I used to work with Becca Berger closely, a former librarian. She always seemed to be interested in trying to help the community. But anyway, it always came back to if the locality provides building, we can put a library branch in it. Here it seems we can provide more space. Maybe they can put a new library branch in. That's why I'm saying other communities in this county are not getting the the same service. Uh, it was alluded to the island being part of the study, and we knew something was going to happen. But the concern with the study for the members on the committee at the time was how the staffing would happen for any facility that was being built. There is a dead zone or the area where calls are not uh, as responsive outside of the 10 mile area from Sturgeon Bay or from Sister Bay, and that's the Egg Harbor Jacksonport area. So trying to provide the services to that area, the way I read that study report was that that was the next area of consideration. I'm not trying to say that people on the island should not have similar services, but when we only have so much money to go around and we're borrowing so much money, a million dollars. I say borrowing, taking from reserves. I have not experienced the county board doing that so readily before. Dan? Well, first I got to say that we got to do something. You know, and the ambulances are going to be 
kicked off basically, and we have to do something. And we've been looking at this for the last three or four or five years. And um, I haven't heard anybody come up with a different solution than this. Um, at one time, I thought we should build brand new. When I found out that this rehab of this building was going to be basically at least as big, if not bigger, and it was cheaper, that's why I thought it would be a good idea to do the. And I haven't heard anybody come up with a, a solution, a piece of property, or anything else. And uh, I'd like to hear about what Joel's got to say. It was coming here tonight. But, um, well, first of all, I will say this of the 12 emails that you all got, is all that I received as well, which I think. As a representative on the island, it's pretty much appalling to me because my phone number and door has been open since I was the town chairman of the town. Not one person has called and asked. Um, this is difficult for me to talk about because, first of all, it's out of context, in my opinion, when we talk about EMS. I have said since day one that I would never support a straight EMS facility. Never. Not financially, not nothing. To me, this is about providing other services to the island and the community that are not up there now that the county does hodgepodge all over here and other places on the island, unprotected, on you know, internet, not uh, you know, medical type stuff, but human services, the doctors, public health, meetings, all that stuff. It's really, really up there. Right now, they're different, it's been working, but it's not the greatest thing. But the way things are going today, we can all agree that that shit's gonna stop. The other thing that's part of this is everything happens in the, in the community center out there where the clinic is. With the COVID stuff going on, there's conversations about stuff that's not going to be able to happen in the clinic setting anymore. So there's a whole other facility that the town has that is probably going to be looked at. They're trying to get a dentist up there and an eye doctor, which is there. There's no single-handed government facility other than what the town has that, in my mind, the county should be doing what it tries to do better out there, and this is an opportunity to do it. I supported and I was with Lou all along, talking with Bruce and trying to make this whole thing happen. I was not part of any of the buildings and grounds committee, nor privy to any of the meetings and discussions that happened, dipping back and forth on stuff. I was weighing it all in and taking what I was hearing from the committees, from directors, department heads, everything else, just chewing on it. And then all of a sudden, when when uh, the, the option came forward to uh, about the dairy, that I think Scott had talked to the candidate one time. Um, you know, that opened a whole new other avenue. That was even talked about prior to this when the town was looking at stuff on the facility that they currently have it, where the town shop is, the EMS, the ambulance. The building is old and it's foolish for the town to put a penny into it, if, in my opinion. Something needs to happen. Now, can I support either one? Absolutely. But I am leaning towards the dairy right now. And I, I'm going to, if people are mad at me for taking that position, so be it. It's in my backyard like everybody else. It's been on Facebook, it's been on social media, and half the crap that's on there is inaccurate information. It's all been answered and vetted to all of us, through the committees at the county. If somebody's got a problem with that, then contact the committee. It's not my job to babysit and keep telling people. They need to come to me, I will provide information, or should you do a committee that they need to go to? Call Ken, call Graham, call Dan, call whoever. That's how the system works, which is part of the problem because people don't know how the damn system works. And maybe that is my fault, okay? But at the end of the day, something's got to happen. And right now, my gut, my heart is telling me that focusing on the dairy project is the best avenue that we can do to benefit. What I've been trying to accomplish down here for 13 years is getting something happen on the island. Better on the island. Not that it's not happening, but just more fair. Plain and simple. It's not personal. It's not, you know, saying that we're not getting it. The island is... Part of the tax base, like Southern Door, like Union, like whatever. The difference is, I can't drive down here at the end of the day and go home at the end of the day. It's just, you know, you know what I mean. It just, it, it's different. We all have to accept that we were part of it. That's why we have representation on there. We're trying to make this all come together, be civil about it. But my blood has been boiling for the last thirty days on an anxiety on all this crap. And I tell you what, my patience is really high. I have tolerance for a lot of stuff. I'm at the point now where I'm ready to say, you know what? Let's scrap the whole freaking thing. Like, I'm going to figure it out. That's where I'm at, but I'm not going to do that. We need to work together and make something happen. The EMTs cannot be the focus. This is about a greater, bigger, looking forward 
for the future for North County. Unfortunately, it's on an island. Okay, that's the way it is. I can't control that. But to put the limelight on the EMS service right now, I think is doing this justice. And I said before, that's not the focus for me. It's been the greater good of everything. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I could ramble on here for probably two hours. But my heart, my goal, my guts are telling me that right now, the dairy is the way to go, and the cards will fall where they need to go going forward with the town and everything else that's going to come out of it. The 12 people that are up in arms in the last 20 days over the last four years, they haven't said, Pete, you know what? You can deal with that. They'll get over it. They'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. I live in Kitty Corner to this location. I know it just as good as anybody else what's going on there. Grew up there. It's not an end all to the world. I'm doing this. It's no different than the city having an old highway shop, you know, on the main bread. Or Walgreens on a corner where there's traffic. We have enough stop right there, but it's busy. I get that. Is there a water issue there once maybe a year when it floods? Yes, it doesn't go to the building, it runs down the ditch. That's why they have culverts. Everything that's been talked about and discussed on stuff has been talked about and embedded, to my knowledge, through the committees in the last four years. There's not one alarming thing to me that sets out on why this could not be a potential benefit to the community of the county, not just an island that even though it's located there. End of story. That's where I'm going. I support this. Okay, I will. Uh recognize Dale and also Vinny, they were the next two, but those are the last two questions we'll take. This whole discussion, if the resolution passes, will open the whole thing up for debate from, from day one again. So it's not meant to be the, 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 the whole subject to be debated now. That would be after the resolution would pass or fail. So, Dale? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree with the things in regards that there has to be something up at Washington Island. I don't think that's the question. My struggle is, and I've done some research, my struggle is on the finances. I think it's the same thing that, that Roy has. And, and I'm kind of concerned about that because when I started to look at it, I went back to Monk, uh, uh, to that situation. And it's my understanding, and uh, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, these numbers may be a little bit off, but I think that building, the, the new building there was close to $2 million. Is that correct? Well, Somewhere. And I think the county paid about $800,000 of it. And I think the balance of it was a referendum that they did. And, and that's what the townships happened to, happened to chip in for. Okay. I think, uh, and just, just as an example, there are 3,252 of, of the taxable the parcels in the three townships. There are 3,214 residences, okay? Now, in, in Sister Bay, kind of the same thing happened. There was a shared cost, am I, am I not correct on that? And I think those numbers weren't a lot different the total numbers as to the cost and the, and 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 what the townships happen to uh, to chip in. Am I correct on that? Somewhere? Okay. Um, the um, Washington Island has twenty two hundred and forty three parcels and seven hundred and twenty of the residences. Liberty Grove, I think, is 1,750 residents. I didn't happen to check on the, on the parcels. What I am concerned about is, it, it, it is down the road with the financing. Um, we, have, we have a model, a precedent right now of the county and, and the townships sharing. If we have and, and uh, we've got that now. If we start out a new precedence and we start to pay everything, what's going to happen down the road? I, uh, I went to the Sebastopol, uh, the town meeting um, a week ago. I don't know if you're aware of this, but, uh, but, but Biz and I have agreed to go to the, to the, uh, the town meeting every other month and let them know what's happening at, at the county board because they want to know. So we've done that. 
done that. Well, I went to the meeting, and at that meeting, they signed a new contract with the Sturgeon Bay Fire Department. And the new contract was the first year they're paying $360,000 for the for the fire service of the search and big fire department. The second year, 377,000, and the third year, 300, close to 390,000. Now, would it be farther, uh, would they be farther ahead to have the county to build a new building for them? Uh, uh, I, I don't think they're asking for it, but the precedent I'm concerned about is what's going to happen when the other townships want new buildings. Well, you did it for Washington Island, and I know there's a lot of reasons for it, Joel, and, and I, I agree with that, but I, I, I'm really concerned about that. And um, I think that if, if the township wants or needs some additional services, then it should be something that uh, they have to, the township has to put uh, some of their money in the game. Uh, yes. Okay, so everybody, with, with what, what's on the table, we're not providing anything for the town. So I guess I, I just want to clarify that for you so you're comfortable in what you're thinking. We are not providing anything for the town in this building. Money. That's what I'm talking about. No, but we're not. We're not. I just wanted to clarify that aspect. We're not. We're not providing anything for the town in terms of them using the building or anything. Like that. if they would choose to build the fire department or add on a fire department, all of those partnerships come back into play that they pay to play. So they are. The precedent is not. I guess it's not there. If if they want to come into the future, they will pay to play on that site. Yes. So, so, so I, I'm so, not following you. Aren't are we planning to? We are not. We are not housing any of their equipment, any of their fire equipment, or anything's not being stored at that facility. But we're, this is strictly all county facility equipment and staffing and operations. But we're paying 1.8 million, right? We're going to put in 1.8 million. Correct into the building, and if they want to put a fire department there, they will pay an offsetting cost. I, I understand that. I just think that that if if the township feels they need it, and the other as the other residents around have put some money in, that it's important that the taxpayers there put some money in if that's what they want, <clears throat> because we're spending a million dollars more than we spent on other on other. Uh, uh, project, are we not, or am I wrong? That's what I'm talking about. That aspect. Am I wrong or not? Well, you're wrong. You're talking about apples and oranges. Yeah, we're not talking. To, you're not talking the same thing in my mind. In all the examples you brought up, there was a partnership, Sister Bay, Bugs. Yeah, both of those are partnerships where we are. The buildings are storing their equipment. They're housing their staff, their functions. It's a truly a joint facility. Washington Island, this is our facility, only our use. It's our operations, has nothing to do with the town. Should the town want to choose and build or add fire later, they will pay to play on that site. In other words, they will contribute costs to be there. That makes it an equal partner that it'll be exactly like Buck, it'll be exactly like Sister Bay. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. Okay, well, maybe I was wrong, but it just, it, uh, it just seems like it's it's a huge amount of money to pay. I, I mean, to build something like that, that maybe it should be scaled down or something. But if I was wrong, I apologize. No, you don't have to apologize. I'm just trying to clarify. Please don't ever apologize. I'm just trying to clarify the thought process. Okay, I vote in vain. This will be the last comment or question before we go to the vote. Thank you for having me speak three times, but I. Um, I fully support this. I think the cost is fairly reasonable for a public building for the, the things that we will be getting with that and being able to do to expand county services and to improve county services in an area that is part of our county. It has a geographical challenge, as people have said, but that is not their fault. So 
So they still deserve to have equal and same services, which they do pay taxes for already as being in part of the county. So I think that that's very important. And I would just end in saying, I don't know why we would spend more money for less facilities. That's why I fully support this. Thank you. Okay, we will go to the vote on this. I, I will remind, and Grant, you can check me make sure I'm right on this. Um, if, you, if you vote yes on this, and it passes, then it would be as though the resolution that we passed last month, we would start over and debate from the beginning that resolution. Uh, if, it, if this fails, if you vote no and it fails, then that's the end of it. Our vote last month uh, stands as it was. Yeah, can you clarify that? So we're not, sorry, so we're so not this voting is, for the, pro, we're not voting for or against the project, we're voting for or against reconsidering. Correct. This is simply a vote to reconsider our last month's action. Yes. That's yeah. right. yeah. yeah. so we'll answer so, this question, no, so that's so, important. Yeah. So if you vote yes, everything's back on the table, like we did take action. If you vote no, that means the action last month stays in place and we continue to move forward.
expectations we, ex we expected. Um, after those four or five years, we're gonna revisit the management options. And if the conditions don't improve, we'd like to go back to those options and see what our options are still left. So the slide up there now is the timeline uh, from, the, from the beginning of the project, from the study all the way through where we're at now, which is that yellow arrow in mid-August. The midpoint of the drawdown will be September 30th, so the end of next month. We'll be halfway through the drawdown. And then again, it'll end September 1st of 2021, and we'll evaluate the success after that. One of the key slides here with the observations to help you guys better understand where we're at. So this is a bathymetric study that we did um, prior to the recommendation. And if you look on the top there, the impoundment is about 94 acres. 92% of that impoundment, or about 84, 86 acres, is less than three feet of water depth. And that's when the water is at capacity and flowing over the concrete spillways. So those red areas and orange areas and starting to get into your yellow areas, that's less than three feet. The areas that are green are greater than three feet. So up to 6, 6.1 6 is the deepest spot. If you could look down by the dam, which is the bottom right-hand corner of that picture, that is our green area. That's our deepest water within the, the impoundment. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go through. And I will show that picture again here coming up. <coughs> so the next slide, please. This is uh, 2019, spring of 2019. Pond is at capacity. Um, it's flowing over the top of the spillways, and I don't think it's flowing through the sluice spill at this point in time. But that's what the mill pond looks like at capacity. The next slide is a couple of drone pictures. The one on the left is June 17th of this year, and the one on the right is August 6th. And there's a couple of, it's hard to see on the screen, but what you'll see is on the, the west and east shores is that there's a lot of green coming in to the mill pond. What that is is vegetation. Vegetation is creeping in from the edges towards the channels, which means it's drying out gradually like expected from the outside in. The other thing I want to point out on this photo is that the channels in the photo on the left back in June, they're kind of a little bit all over the place. Um, and as you get into August, those channels are becoming much more defined, which was expected as well. <laughs> And I'll apologize for this because the photo on the left, I covered up the date um, by accident. I should put the other photo underneath the other one. But the photo on the top left is May 13th. That was one of the first time periods where the mill pond this spring draw down to a point where we're seeing channels. Um, and it's hard to see here, but in the middle of that photo, just to the right of the driftwood, there's one big rock that's evident. And again, that's in May. A little more than two months later, the, the July 31st photo on the bottom, that same rock is still there, but you can also see several other rocks. And the theory is, is that as the sediment is starting to decompose and settle, some of these rocks that are buried are starting to show through. So that's a sign that the compaction is starting to work. The other thing I'll point out is that bottom photo on the right, you can see a lot more green vegetation upwards along the shoreline in the woods. Um, we did conduct a vegetation study. We found 27 different species, one of which might be an invasive cattail. It's too early to tell, but the other 26 were definitely uh, native species. The last thing in that photo was, again, just the channel. Sorry, again. Um, if you look at the photo on top left, you see kind of a braided channel. But the channel on the bottom right, again, it's becoming more established as one channel versus multiple, which is good. All right, this photo, uh, both of them are August 3rd of this year, and it's on the west end of the dike, so just you know, west of the spillways. And it's towards the end of it, but it's uh, where that picture is taken is probably a couple hundred feet away from the shoreline. And what you're seeing is those sediments starting to crack. Oxygen is starting to get down into that sediment through those cracks and starting to decompose those sediments. And what's difficult to see on this photo is that just to the right of my foot, there's a couple of rocks there. There's some sediment on top of those rocks that are going through this decomposition process. So you'll see like really white to light gray, and then when you get into the sediments, you see the dark muck. What's happening is, is that organic matter is shedding its water, carbon dioxide is disappearing, and the minerals are being left behind. 
So if you think about our hard water situation here in the county with calcium carbonate and your coffee makers, that white grayish color of the minerals is starting to show up on the sediments as they decompose. Again, another good sign that it's starting to, to work. Okay, this is a very complicated slide. I'm gonna bear with me as I work our way through it again. So the top left photo is that bathmetric survey. In that photo, there's that green area in the bottom left corner that is our deepest water when the mill pond is full. The bottom photo in the foreground, you'll see the channels, you'll see a little bit of ponding, and you'll see a different color, basically that muck brownish color, that is that same area in that photo above. That area is about three to four acres in size, depending on how much water or rain events that we receive. We mentioned the, the water levels We're at near uh, record rainfalls again this year, as we've had for several years now. So yes, this pond has gone up, it's gone down, it's gone up, it's gone down. Most of the cases, it's gone up a couple of feet. Um, the August rain that we had back on the 8th and the 9th, of two to three inches, it filled up almost to capacity. Not quite, but almost. Six days later, it was right back down. So depending on the conditions of the soils, the conditions of the crop fields, the forests, everything else, these rainfalls have different impacts at different times of the year. So I broke it down into these next four bullets by May, June, July, and August. And what I did is I have days exposed and days ponded. To clarify that, those days exposed is when the majority of the mill pond, when the sediments have been exposed to sunlight and to air. So basically, most of that area was not ponded. And the days ponded, again, vice versa, most of the area was ponded. How did I determine that? Well, visually with pictures and also with science. The mill pond is designed with the spillways, the permanent spillways, to discharge the water at a certain elevation. 3.6 feet below that spillway is the top of the sluice valve. So once I can see the sluice valve, I know that over 86 acres in the mill pond are exposed to the conditions for, dry, for the drying of the organic matter. So that's how I determined it. So May, we had a wet month. We had nine days exposed, 21 days ponded. June, we had seven days exposed and 19 days ponded, four days that I did not know what happened. And I'll explain that because as these water levels are coming down, they're coming down at a point where sometimes it's a couple inches a day. And I don't know what day, particularly when it was a Saturday or Sunday, when it will drop below the sluice valve. So there's days that could have gone either way, whether it's ponded or, or not. So take it for that. It, uh, okay, so July, we had 27 days exposed, two days ponded, and two days that I don't know. In August, as of the 20th, we had 11 days exposed. So since then, we have not had significant rainfall. It's now at 16 days and seven days ponded. So that's where we're at. Um, that's what I've seen. And uh, I'll take questions at this point. Just waiting for the screen to come up. David Hennigal. Thank you. Um, the segment that is currently compacting, please remind everybody what we can and cannot do with that material. In other words, it's obviously foreign to the space of ground area, but we can't move it, correct? Uh, we could move it. Um, if we do move it, we'll have to get a little hazard exemption uh, permit. If we get that permit, we have to have a site that is approved for the disposal of it. It will have to meet certain requirements uh, from distance from bedrock and groundwater. And we'll also have, also have to have a cap over the top of it so that any rainfall that hits that cap sheds off of the material before it infiltrates and goes through the groundwater. And that's very similar to the dredging done at some of the shallower docks or harbors in the past. Right. It all depends on the level of contaminants. This is a low level um, atmospheric type of deposit. We can't just apply it to a farm field, um, but it's not like we have to put it in a landfill. Okay. Um, many times it's been commented about there's supposed to be no sediment going downstream. I don't see that being 
impossible to occur. So reiterate what everybody understood was going likely to happen. Okay. During the drawdown, the initial part of the drawdown, we were limited to three inches per day. And once we hit that drawdown period, the valve was to remain open unless there was maintenance issues. It was fully expected that sediment would discharge downstream, as most streams discharge sediment. Um, is there a backlog of sediment there? Yes. And will it continue to discharge sediment? Yes. What we're seeing is that when the, the sluice valve starts to appear, the water levels drop, we see that we're seeing a little more sediments coming out of the, the, the system. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but what it's saying is that the sediment is coming from the channel. We know that the channel will scour. We know that the channel will get down to the native earth before it stops discharging sediment. What I will say is that when the pond has been filling up and things settle down for a couple of days and you take a walk down the dike, you can actually see the rocks at the bottom of the mill pond in the middle of summer, something that I've never been able to see before. So what it's saying, and what I'm saying is that those sediments are starting to compact, they're starting to get hard, and they're not resuspending every time a carp swims by or the wind blows. So yes, sediment will discharge. Yes, it will stabilize. And when you say we, you do refer to the uh, Clark County and the DNR. Correct. <laughs> uh, and the only other thing is this slide, because it's difficult for me to see, to see could we have this uh, put in the Door County agenda uh, subdirectory? Uh, the supervisor subdirectory, so we can take a look at it on our tablets. Yes, sure. Thank you. So, thank you. Thank you. I would appreciate that as well. Thanks for that request. Um, I um, appreciate this information very much. I appreciate how it's been um, put forward. I did make a couple other requests as well, and I believe those hopefully will be addressed uh, next month. Uh, in regards to other parts of this project, including um, <clears throat> no point you writing the wheel here. I can just figure it out. Um, um, including input um, specifically um, from the DNR, if possible, and also uh, I think it would be appropriate to include an assessment of the nutrient management plans and the runoff. That are is associated with the Ambu River Basin um, and how it relates to this project and the pond. Um, I am also curious, and you may not have this information when it comes to this sediment, which um, I think, if I'm hearing you correctly, it, it is contaminated. Right? There are there are contaminants in there. What I'm hearing from you is it doesn't need to be put into a landfill, but we can't just spread it on the field. Um, I would like to know with that sediment, like if we're testing downriver as well, and what is happening because of the action that we've taken on this project, if anything has, has come of that. Um, I'd be interested in that information. If you have it, um, I understand that that may not be available currently and that we may need to revisit that. Um, is it accurate to uh, think that some of the vegetation that is coming into play here would then also help to um, help with that decomposition process and also help stabilize and hopefully not have um, a public health issue? of a blast of mycosis or something of that nature. Does that vegetation come into play in those? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Do you mind speaking on that? I, I just, I don't, I, it seems obvious to me that it would, but. Yeah, as, 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 as vegetation establishes, that sediment is becoming more stabilized. There's more roots. The sediments are coming becoming harder and more confined. Whereas before the vegetation was there, when it was saturated, that stuff would you could just walk the water and suspend. So one of the DNR perspective um, individuals stated that as more vegetation gets established, the chances of blastomycosis become much, much less. Okay, thank you. And then may I to follow up also, um, another concern that I have, or not concern, but question is, <laughs> if we're gonna be revisiting this 
Um, yes, it was put forth as a two-year drawdown. We've had a lot of rain events. Is there a possibility that this would be that it would be determined that in order for us to get the desired result that this goes past that mark by a bit? Would it go longer than two years? Before? Would it go longer than two years? I mean, since we're having so many rain events, it's been it's been rainy. I mean, what are the if we're not going to get our desired results at two years, um, and if, again, if you're not prepared for this, I completely understand. Yeah. But I, I think we committed to refilling it after two years and, and see how things went. <laughs> and if we didn't have our desired impact, then we'll go back to the drawing board. But I don't see it being extended. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Roy? Uh, yes, just one question. Are we planning to spray our 35 acres that the county owns for weeds before we refill it next year? If there's invasive phragmites, yes. But the cattails, no. Okay. Thank you. Laura? I think, uh, has there been any markers of set of, or amount of markers for decreasing of the settled sediment yet? Where are we at with that? Good question. Um, a lot of this, we can't really get out there with survey equipment yet. Um, some places we can, but again, we've only had a couple of months of good compaction. Um, so it's early in the game yet. Um, we are trying to get some drone footage to get some elevations, though the software is rather complicated and costly. Um, we didn't have that proposed to begin with, but we're starting to look at that as a potential option. Um, but certainly, at the very least, we're going to do the bathmetric survey again once it's refilled. Another question. We can expect then the muddiest area closest to the dam is going to be probably the least compacted because that's where water is going to back up our retention. So the least amount of growth as we go forward. Absolutely. And I would also suspect on that tough question you had last on if we're at the two-year mark or not, is that it would be ideal to get the most compaction if you even have to extend a year or not, then just refill and say, okay, this isn't working because our third option was to take the dam out. So I recall being on this, this vote recommendation was to take the dam out, restore it to natural area. This was the compromise because the dredging was so expensive to do the drawdown. So we really do want to see this drawdown be successful for those people living in that area. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I just uh, um, we all saw that video of the deer. Kira, can you get closer to the microphone? Sorry. Thank you. Um, we all saw the video of the deer in the, in the month. But I was wondering if you could speak on that and if there are any barriers or if there's any signs or anything, um, if there would be people that wandered in or, or um, children, you know, like I was just wondering about barriers, I guess. There aren't any barriers out there, but there might, there's a couple of signage just saying the whole launch is closed, and there's all kinds of uh, literature at the park that explains the drawdown. Thank you. Bob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Greg. Um, I have a question about the sediment. Um, the question came up about well, once it compacts, do I think maybe Dave asked it, um, you know, would there be a consideration to move it? Now, you mentioned about that, or just stated that it's contaminated, but is that just, are we just assuming that it is because it's sediment in a river? Um, or, I mean, because you said something about it, if we moved it, we would have to have a, a, a specific place to put it and then cap it. Is that just because that's just what, we, we, we assume that because that's what the DNR just assumes, or has any testing actually been done in the sediment? We did conduct uh, testing with six different core samples and consulting with the DNR on what levels we had. There were low levels of contamination and asked where, what are the sources of these contaminations? And, and basically it's atmospheric deposition. So what you're seeing in the mill pond is likely going to be in the Anape River throughout. Um, the rain is going to fall across both uniformly. Um, but working with the DNR, we sat down several times trying to discuss, okay, what are our options with this? Can it go to a landfill? Absolutely. Can it be fields uh, applied? No. 
Can it be put into an abandoned gravel pit, provided that it meets all the conditions? It's, yes. So a lot of our estimates were done based on that actual sites where this could go. Um, I think the only thing that would change right now is that a dry dredge, I don't think it's feasible anymore. The only type of dredge would be a hydraulic type of dredge, which makes the cost exponentially higher. Thank you. Susan. Um, I actually have two. So we get to next September. I just want to clarify procedure. If we were to get to the point at which it was time to start refilling, and for some reason it was determined that we don't necessarily want to do it yet, that would have to come back to the committee and the county, or that would be a staff decision, or how, how would a decision like that happen? Right now, it would have to flow from the staff through the oversight committee back to the county board because the county board was instrumental in making the decision to do the drawdown. And I anticipate that staff will give a final report uh, to the oversight committee and ultimately to the county board. And the county board would then have the opportunity to decide uh, how to proceed. Okay, thank you. And the other part is if, I don't know if this is answerable, but when you when we decided to do this, that we knew that the variables of weather or whatever would, would there's no way to predict that. So there are parameters that you're looking at to see. I, I think, you know, we had more rain than we expected, but we seem to be making progress. And I think what I'm hearing you say is that what we're seeing is not within the realm of failure. It's, it is very possible that the markers we're seeing could result in this doing what we want it to do, given the, the variables of nature. Is that a fair statement? It is. I would, I would say the only surprise I've had is the amount of driftwood that has dried out. And then when we get rainfall, it suspends, it comes downstream, and it plugs up the sluice valve of the gates. That's been my biggest surprise during this project. Thank you. Megan? Thank you very much. Um, I would like to see, and I'm not sure how um, this would be put into action, but we have had some requests from that community to um, ramp up that fencing or blockading above and beyond what the current signage and explanation is in order to help protect um, people, pets, uh, wildlife, um, in in the, the mill pond during this time. So if that is a resource that we have available um, here at the county, I think that it would behoove us to um, add to what is is currently in place. Just just from that aspect, the I mean that's 30 I mean we wouldn't be able to fence it if you went out there. I mean most of the stuff right now has cut tails or tall vegetation mm -hmm. around it. And I know we improved the fencing on the dam itself for the requirements, but I don't foresee us adding additional fencing around the entire pond. We, that does not be what's been useful. Yeah, what's been um, suggested to me would be those portions that were um, accessible kind of like by the dock. Oh, by the boat launch? Okay. By the boat launch okay. um, and, and alongside where the park was. Okay. Because that really truly is the space where <laughs> yeah, uh, visitors are, are still there or, you know, there used to be on Okay. That's what's been suggested. Thank you. Vinny? Sorry. Okay. Um, great. Thank you for the report and for the work. And um, can you clarify again? I think it just helps because most of the comments I've had from people about this project from the public are not understanding that part of recreating a stream bed involves sediment transporting to a to tell the stream bed is reestablished. So you kind of address that, but. As that stream bed was reestablished, that was the initial sedimentation going out. Now, as it refills, it doesn't reestablish every single time and transport that same amount of sediment. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And that's one of the things we were watching. Is, and you can see that on the drone photos that that footprint of the channel is staying the same. 
there's a significant amount of sediment sitting right in front of that dam that, that's in that green area or that brown area that is staying put. Um, there's also some sediment right at the last spillway or the front spillway in front of the sluice that is staying put. So it's it's the scouring of the channels, and I'm confident to say that that's where the sediment is coming from. And just that's natural and was always expected from my understanding in originally approving this project from front of the county board. And I knew that that would be what happens. Right. The, the DNR said that uh, through all the other different drawdowns that you have scouring of that channel until it stabilizes. It all depends on that gradient, how fast that occurs. So a steeper gradient that'll flush through faster and establish and stabilize, but a, a low gradient like this one takes a little longer. Uh, thank you again. Um, I just want to reiterate, <coughs> excuse me, um, the need for robust signage um, from prior experience on places like this. Uh, that and you showed it kind of in the pictures where it's certain that 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 muck will start to crust over and it looks stable and looks solid and it's easy to think you want to walk up there and you get out so far it's almost like walking down on ice in, on a pond when all of a sudden it kind of gives way and before you know it, you're up to your knee or your thigh um so i you know it's not a quick sand situation i'm not you know and again i, I don't want to create any sort of false um false safety notion but i think i you know, and i apologize i just haven't been down there and, quite a while. I don't know what the current signage is, but whatever our signage is, it should be robust and, and letting people know that the service, you know, can give you a false sense of security as far as, you know, just don't walk out there, I guess that's the bottom line. So whatever we can do to make the signage, um, let people know that it might look safe, but it's not. Thank you. Susan? Um, one other thing that I've read in emails that we get is the idea that the <laughs> management plans of the farms and fields that are what want to say upstream from the from the dam um that somehow the county has to you know manage that better or something because we do get runoff from that there's no way with a rain event or whatever that we won't get any um so i wonder if you could just Comment again. I, mean, I know that soil and water continues to manage those, continues to do, but that a lot of it is in the hands of the, the person that owns the land and that they have control that, you know, in terms of if somebody's using their field, you could say anything about that. That some of that is the stewardship of the people who, who own the land. Yeah, briefly, I'll, uh, nutrient management plans are developed annually, every year. So it's based on what they predict we'll put in there for crops and for fertilizer, et cetera. Mother Nature changes those plans in a heartbeat. Um, we monitor them on an annual basis and we look for compliance on an annual basis. It's just a matter of how many courses we have to, to do that work. Greg, you mentioned briefly the contaminants mainly were from above, water events, et cetera. I guess the question maybe off of Susan's question is, um, I think the, the association is that there's manure runoff and all kinds of fertilizer runoff, et cetera, from upstream, and that is what is in sediment, and that is what the contaminant is. Yeah, you said earlier that it's mainly from <coughs> rainfall type of contaminants and contaminants that are in there. Can you explain that? Yeah, the, the sediment cores looked at a lot of heavy metals, um, mercury, arsenic, lead, some of the stuff that you see from factories smoke it's up in the atmosphere rains so those are the low levels of contaminants the farm nutrients are looking more at phosphorus nitrogen potassium stuff like that those are kind of the things that exist in nature naturally um, those aren't the nutrients or the contaminants that are going to keep you from spreading out of field um, it's those heavier metals that you want to keep out of your water so that that's the difference so could both contaminants be there absolutely how you manage it is different. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We appreciate. Oh, sorry, Megan. Are, are we testing for those contaminants as well, or just for the heavy metals? Can you clarify when? <laughs> uh, since this project has started, or prior to. Prior to when we started, when we started, you know, having the conversation. Yeah, the, the watershed study, because the, the heavy metals are a very expensive test, we did those once 
uh, through six different cores throughout the basin. As far as the other nutrients from ag sources, we picked those up in the water samples, and we did a lot of water sampling before that. We will repeat those water samples again afterwards. I don't think it pays to redo the metals because... No, yeah, I, I, I understand that. So as far as testing the sediment, for the agricultural... And it was whether or not we wouldn't be looking to dump that on a field. I guess that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking what we're sending downstream more so and what we're sending into the lake. Yeah, we have not tested the sediment command. Okay, thank you. David, Yes, uh, Greg, there were some comments made about nutrient management. And I think there's a little misconception there that it does everything to control erosion, and that's not really the case. So you're looking at the nutrients that are applied to the field and putting only what's needed there, and it does address some erosion. But there's other things like cover crops and other programs that is the department pushing those things to control the erosion aspect of the egg fields around? Absolutely. Dr. Dove? Yes. Because as was alluded in the study in the beginning, Going back 20 years ago, I was looked at there's so much erosion taking place, so much sediment coming to the pond, and it hasn't really improved in those 20 years. Just last week, we installed the grass waterway in that watershed. So, all that stuff is going on. Maybe. Thank you, Greg. Um, I guess in the simplest way possible, you can because it's a complex question, but I think it helps people to understand that. Yes, we don't want any agricultural runoff to occur in our county, but is that even 100% possible from any department standpoint? And that's a, and just kind of how we had a presentation earlier about being the arm of the state and how much of the work that's done in that depends on what state funding is available, how much staff is available, how many grants we receive. It, it isn't just a black and white kind of a law that no runoff can occur. It may, it may be on a certain event, but there's so many other factors that play into that that if you can answer that a little bit, I think it helps for just general knowledge. Yeah, we're following the statewide standards and prohibitions, and are they 100% effective? No. But we're doing what we can do to the best of our abilities. All right, thank you, Greg. Thank you. It. Thank you. All right, we're going to move directly to the resolutions at this moment in time so we can get that business accomplished. Um, resolution 2020 19 Declaration of State of Limited. Uh, uh, sorry, that was just, we didn't have that on while we're still under the, the, the emergency declaration. Again, this is FYI, and there's no updates on that. Resolution 2020 65 in memoriam, uh, Harvard Malzahn. And I'll so move. I'll second. And I'll read. Okay. To the Door County Board of Supervisors, whereas Harvey Melzahn passed away on July 30th, 2020, and whereas Supervisor Melzahn was first elected to the County Board, was supervised to serve from 1974 through January 1989, and whereas during his tenure of County Board, Supervisor Melzahn represented various districts, served on numerous committees, commissions and boards, and held many leadership positions, including serving as county board chairman from 1982 through 1989. Whereas Harvey Melzahn also served as highway commissioner for Dark County from 1989 to 1999 for a total of 10 years. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the Dark County Board of Supervisors assembled in regular session this 25th day of August 2020, extend their sincere sympathy to the family of Harvey Melzahn with this acknowledgement of his dedication to the citizens of Dorka. By voice vote, all in favor? Aye. Aaron, thank you. Resolution 2020-66, Committee Appointment Board of Adjustment. Sure, this, uh, uh, we were in a long search for finally getting someone appointed to the Board of Adjustment. You can see the individuals listed there along with a little bit of background, and we're just looking for your confirmation of that. So make, make a motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve uh, Resolution 2020-66. I'll second. Any questions? Comments? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
by voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Resolution 2029 6 approval of gift grant and or donation to our county sheriff's office, AAA Foundation for Traffic Safety Grants. Joel. I would like to make a motion to approve, Mr. Chairman, please. I'll second. Explanation? Uh, I guess in the quick look for our lines, uh, 18 and 19, it's a grant for $7,000, for uh, traffic safety operations. Questions? We will vote. Let us pass on the vote of 19 yes. You will name two absent. Resolution 2020-6A, approval of gift grant and or donation to the County Sheriff's Office, Cops Office Community Policy, Policing Development Micro Grant. Joel? I would also like to make a recommendation a motion to approve this resolution as well, please. Yeah. 19 second. Uh, the work for on this one lines 22 through 24. Uh, for wellness and health and mental illness uh, for checks um, for the department. Any questions? We'll go to the voting board. Yeah, it didn't come up. I'm trying to get it. There it is. Sorry. Sorry. Let's pass on the vote of 19 yes, zero nay, two absent. Thank you. Resolution 2020 69, approval of gift grant and or donation to our county sheriff's office. $5,000 donation for purchase of reserve division squad. Joel? Yes, thank you. And also, I can make a motion to approve this resolution. Second. Uh, as identified, uh, as a reserved individual would like to donate $5,000 towards the uh, vehicle. Okay. David, anyone? Yes, real really stupid request. Because after reading it, I really wasn't sure what this was for. Can we put the word vehicle or something in there in the future? Because, <laughs> you know, there is a physical squad of people, right? <laughs> Susan. Thank you. Another clarification. I'm assuming that we're not going to find a vehicle for $5,000, or do we have a vehicle in mind that is $5,000? So... If we didn't, we would put this towards it and then come up with the rest. So the, the answer to that is the one of the vehicles that would be traded in, they've given the value of uh, trading the $5,000, so we're going to retain it and get it now. Thank you. Where did you still want? Yeah, the board board. Let us pass on the vote of 19 yes, zero nay, two absent. Resolution 2020-70, facilities and parks, transfer of non-budgeted fund for John Miles Park safety fence. Dan. Also, move that we pass that. Second. Do you want to be doing this plan or should we have Ken? Sure, do the, the quick version, as you can see in the resolution itself, uh, at John Mills Park, the uh, fence is in need of repair. I guess we consider along the, I guess the curves that I guess are common with uh, the Thunder Park subdivision is behind there. That's where the area of where we have the most, um, I guess, degradation from the fence in that area. They did out, we did you know, an offer for engineering study in terms of what would be done in terms of replacement, and then that would be used about for a bit. You can see the bid came in at $77,735. Uh, 
uh, but we're looking at using this forty thousand dollars from, I guess, existing funds that we have for John Miles Park, you know, some within his maintenance. Uh, but then the shortfall, we authorize our facilities and um, we finance authorized up to forty thousand dollars that we take it from contingencies to make up that balance. Uh, Bob. I guess it answers part of my question. I was just curious why why we're dipping into unbudgeted funds when this was a you know an item that obviously we know needed maintenance. Why wasn't this in the why wasn't the full amount in the budget? The best explanation that was explained at finance, but also facilities at that time we didn't know the full cost of the project. So I know we had the um in the budget we had thirty five thousand allocated, and then again he's taking another five thousand from his general maintenance, but it came in. I would say, as you can see, it's much higher than we expected. Thank you. Laura? Yes. Uh, just to add to that part of that discussion uh, that Mike, our administrator, spoke about, it was part of the discussion and also reviewing the uh, CIP policy, maybe uh, something to consider too for the future. If this was a fence that needed repair for, as we were told, about seven years. And with the cost coming in so much higher than expected, you know, that's where that request for the 40000 come out. And perhaps we can do better on the maintenance end. So if we do it sooner, um, those costs can, can keep down. But this is a repair that is needed to continue to have community events, not just races, but other, other um, events that take place in our county at this track for the safety and well-being of the housing development that is behind this fence. So... It is needed less uh, less counties, or excuse me, more and more areas and counties throughout the state are getting rid of their grandstands and their fencing and the track. Um, so maintenance on these are important and more regularly. So uh, we can continue to provide and have these types of activities in our county to attract tourism. Thank you. Susan? To add to what Laura is saying too, that um, the timing is, trying to do this this year because it's dry. Since we're not having racing, it can be done this fall. We're getting the equipment on and so on doesn't damage the track. So that was why the timing of doing it now was important. All right, we will go to the board. Let's pass on the vote in 19 yes, zero nine May 2000. Resolution 2020-71, approval of gift, grant, and or donation to our county clerk's office for election security. I'll make the motion to approve. Second. Okay. This was a uh, opportunity through the Wisconsin Elections Commission to apply for an election security grant. I worked in cooperation with Technology Services Department, both Jason and Joanne, to uh, apply for the grant. It will be used to um, purchase additional backup equipment and to conduct a security risk assessment as well. We do have to track it, and we do have to prove that we used it for election security to the state, or we will have to pay it back. Questions? We will go to the order board. All right. Right for that thing. Let's pass on the vote of 19 yes, zero nay, two absent. We'll go back up to the county administrator monthly report. I have nothing specific to report. Obviously, I have the staff memo there. This gives you some basic ideas and some of the larger projects and your updates. Uh, and then the main thing is obviously with our the report in terms of this, our activities related to COVID, we did bring forward a, I guess we're considering the phase two plan of operations that was uh, provided to the administrative committee. And I also included that last week in my communications to the county board. 
And in essence, what we're trying to do is just provide some stability to the employees and level of how we're addressing it into the fall. So the plan is really meant to take us through for sure through the end of the year. My guess is that'll be obviously extended into the first part of the year. But again, it just gives kind of guidance in terms of how we're operating within our departments, uh, how we're doing work schedules in terms of trying to be at least flexible with school starting um, and addressing those needs for our, our working parents. So that has been uh, set into place. And I guess the only other thing, too, is I know that Sue is still online, so I'd like to give her just an opportunity to give you an update of activities from her perspective. Hi, everybody. This is Sue Powers, Public Health Manager and Health Officer. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. So I am going to be brief. Um, COVID activity level remains high across uh, Door County and the state. Our cumulative total number of COVID cases is 127, and 40 of those were since August 1st. So we're right on track for a month, just like July. Currently, we have nine active cases. Um, 115 cases have resolved their acute symptoms and been released from isolation per public health criteria. So we call those people recovered. Um, we remain at three deaths. There have been few hospitalizations since the beginning of this. Um, cumulatively, we've had nine. So <clears throat> since July 1st, we remain busy. We've had averaging one to four cases daily, some days without any, and then a few days with um, more than that. We have observed that um, recently several larger gatherings have contributed to caseload. Uh, these are gatherings, private ones of family and friends for different reasons, different events. And those have called uh, caused clusters of cases. Other than this, most people have really no idea where they've come in contact with the virus. So this speaks to community spread. Um, and then when there's cases like that, we usually get a few cases related to that case patient, their close contacts. Majority of cases, thank goodness, have had mild symptoms, but that's not to say all of them have had mild symptoms. Um, to date, since the beginning of our pandemic response, we have followed up on five cases that are people out of our county, out of our jurisdiction, that were on vacation here, that we ended up doing complete follow-ups on. Um, we've also had a number of notifications from other jurisdictions, other local health departments regarding residents of their jurisdictions that had been here during the infectious period. So then we notify and follow up with the close contacts um, in Door County. In total, you know, our workload uh, regarding out-of-town visitors has comprised only about 10% of our workload. So our priority at public health, of course, remains to follow up <clears throat> on each case in a timely manner to keep our community as safe as possible. Um, I'm happy to be able to say we continue to be able to follow up with new positive cases within 24 hours and then their identified contacts within 48 hours. And that is per the state recommendations. And I'm very glad we're able to do that, of course, because this is how we can prevent spread. We continue doing this seven days a week. Yesterday, we had um, four new part-time contact tracers started. Um, they're going to be working up to 24 hours a week. So they're in training this week and probably next and maybe longer. Um, and these positions are funded by special COVID grants to public health from the state. So we're really glad they're on board. Um, we continue to be in regular contact with our long-term care facilities to help protect those more vulnerable community members we have. And we continue to meet with school leaders regularly, including conversations with the school nurses we're working out specific plans for reporting testing and students or staff and how it might play out if there's cases in the schools. The current really hot topic for all schools here and across the state is consideration of parameters to indicate when to change from in-person to virtual school or closure altogether. So we're working with them on, on those things. Um, we continue to work with the businesses, and actually there's a Zoom meeting set up this afternoon where we will be presenting um, 
a new document we created, uh, what happens if your business has a COVID case of COVID-19. So we're doing that in collaboration with the hospital, Brian Stevens. And if you want to attend that meeting, you can find the link on the, uh, the uh, I believe the Visitor Bureau, uh, Destination Door County and the um, um, ECD. Thank you. <laughs> Door County Economic Development Corporation. I couldn't think of that. Um, we are continuing to work towards increasing availability of testing. Thank you again to Door County Medical Center for doing the once a week testing in Sister Bay. They do also test at their Fish Creek Clinic um, and they still have the COVID tent um, in Sturgeon Bay. All testing is by appointment. Um, hopefully you've heard that on Thursday of this week, there is a community testing event that's going to be at the fairgrounds. That was um, put into place by Bell and Health, Door County Medical Center, and Dan Kane from Emergency Management. The hours are from 10 to 6, and anyone can get tested, and it's free. Um, you don't need to have symptoms. So casting a wild, wide net, um, we've had a lot of requests for testing um, prior to back to school, whether it be college students or others just concerned. So that's really all I have to report, except to say thank you to everyone for continuing to mask up and practice social distancing and frequent hand washing. And if, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. Yes, Sue, we have questions. Okay, got to go. Hey, yes, Sue. Um, with this activity, uh, event here, activities and uh, recommendations that obviously continue to evolve. Um, the scenario I gave you last month is the same variation. Say a visitor came here from Utah, uh, spent time here, went back to Utah, and at that time determined they had, were, had, had the COVID-19 for whatever reason. Uh, has anything changed as far as um, Door County becoming aware of that? Uh, and the reason I ask, obviously, is that the person from Utah may have been in the same restaurants as people from 10 other states. Mm -hmm. So it would be, um, thanks for asking that. It would be similar to what I described. Um, that local jurisdiction would, um, after they do their case investigation, um, asking this person where they were during their infectious period, um, if that was determined that they were in Door County and that there was some close contacts of concern, they would notify us. And then we would follow up with the people here. So it's become more of a mandatory notification of the remote location. Is it mandatory? Yeah. Um, it's what everyone does. I don't know if there's any mandates around it. Um, it is it is best practice across the country for contact tracing. Best practice, I guess, is what I really meant to say. And then the other thing is um, when this first came out and people were talking about symptoms, if symptoms have evolved as well, what are the current list of symptoms that point towards that direction? Yeah, I don't have them in front of me. Um, they're listed on the CDC website and also the Wisconsin Department of Health Services website. And what I can tell you is they recently did list um, loss of sense of taste and loss of sense of smell as um, new symptoms. Okay, and that one's been recognized for at least a few weeks now, so thank you. Mm -hmm. What else? All right, thank you, Susan. Appreciate your time. Appreciate you and everything you're doing with your staff. You're welcome. Okay, we'll drop down to the special reports. All right, well monitoring. Sure, this is in your packet. Um, Okay, just want to get the page number for you. On page 138 of your packet was just the information that we're working on the, um, the testing again for the private well monitoring program. So more than anything, we're trying to get as much information out as possible so the residents know what's available. So again, there's both the, I guess the description from UW Oshkosh, but then also the flyer itself. So if there's any questions or if you could share this with your constituents and in some fashion, we appreciate it very much. And you can see the timeline there that's established the RFCP by September 11th. Um, and you can see that also the cost related to it is $30. So it's just informational. We're trying to get as much information as possible. Laura? 
Yes, thank you. I think it's important with this program. I think it's an important program to have, and we we did it uh, last year. It was put off in spring, and now it's uh, being taken up again this fall. Um, it would be nice to hear more on why it's important to do it and um, addressing the concerns that residents may have on not wanting to do it. There's some things that I've heard such as, well, if I have a contaminated well, how does that financially impact me and my property? Or what does that mean? I don't want a neighbor in trouble. There's some false impressions or ideas that they have with well monitoring or ideas where people feel pollution may or may not be coming from. And there's so much we don't know about groundwater, underground water and the channels and how the water flows and moves. And I think that kind of in a roundabout way come out through the people that are putting this program on. So it's a great collaboration with the university. Um, and I hope that the more constituents and other areas <coughs> and the same areas that we had before will take this up. Unfortunately, it does come with a cost, but yeah. thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have really anything much on the census. Our local district rep reached out to us. Um, she told us that there are people out in the field. She's unable to kind of tell us where they've started or how far they are. We just know that there are people now that will be going door to door and um, to the residences that haven't responded. Um, and they continue to work on that. And the um, deadline to respond has been extended to September 30th. Yes, that's all right. Okay. Questions about the census? Carol, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I know that it was extended to October 30th or something like that. And then they switched it to September. Has there been any outreach or clarification? I feel like I haven't seen anything about the census in a really long time, except that one update we had said that Doe County was low for reporting. Um, but the way I understand it, that it, the, the better response we have, the more resources or the more better numbers we have. So um, with it not being able to really come up again until the end of, of the reporting. I was just wondering if there was any outreach or any anything that we could possibly do to help it along. I do know that we relied uh, on our library staff because they've been doing all the, I guess, education and media from, I guess, the county perspective. So I could follow up with the library to see if they can, again, put a little push out. I know we did talk with, the, again, the regional rep in terms of what their messaging is, but I know they're also limited in terms of what they're doing now in terms of their messaging because they're focused on, the, I guess, the boot from the ground, you could say. But we can, at least from our perspective, we can try to get more information out. Thank you. Alexis? Thank you, Chairman. I'm just wondering if there's a resource for people to check them if they think that they responded to verify that they responded. Like, you can go check your voting, that kind of thing. Is there anything like that for the census? Yeah, there's a, I know our regional director provided us a phone number that they could call. Um, it's to complete, though. It's not to check in. Okay. Thank you. I think the one thing to note, maybe, was that the census invitation or the census information was only mailed to a physical address. So when we look at our return rate, although our regional coordinator didn't feel we were way off base, we're at 47, just over 47%, um, given the times that we're in, uh, she did note that the, the census packets or the invitation to complete is only sent to a physical address. And as many of our Northern reps know, most of our people North have a PO box. So that could be playing into a lot of why uh, our, our response rate is down. So um, they were gonna try to get some postcards out to a PO box, but she wasn't a hundred percent sure on that if that was gonna work or not. Just a quick question to clarify, and I was, I was just trying to look it up as well, but it, it, it says here that it's not typically the, 
it's not the same as your voting residence. It can be, but it's not always counted the same. So I'm just wondering, I think it's a good point to put some more information out because when it typically goes out in the spring, we may have some six month residents have already come back or they haven't. And now that it's September or October, it's kind of the same situation again, where if it's someone, if it's not based on where you vote, then are you a resident of your summer home or your winter home? I know it's also confusing up north. Um, personal situation I ran into is a home that I own that's being used by somebody else, at least as an Airbnb, as an upper unit, a lower unit. And so they delivered cards and door knocks at both, for, even though it's one address, um, you know, two different door knocks. And so the person who was leasing it said, well, what do I do with this? Uh, and was able to go online and get it clarified. And I know that's happening in multiple places out there where they've dropped off door knockers or they've dropped off information. They drop it off at three or four doors on the same house. So it's like they walk around any door they have that they put there trying to get a response. But what's confusing is each one that they leave has got a different code number. So potentially, if you responded to all four, you'd be responding four times for the same residence. So it gets a little confusing. But I, I do know they are out and about and trying door to door. Susan. Um, I would add that my understanding is you're supposed to respond that you are in place wherever it is you're living on April 1st. But one of the concerns was that people with seasonal homes might not be here and therefore think they don't have to fill it up for that residence. And indeed they do. They just need to say nobody was living there at the time. So that every residence is accounted for as to whether a body was living there or not. Okay, that's a self -tick. Um Next, new business. Any oral committee reports? Any minutes? Any vouchers, claims, or bills? Questions? Uh, next regular county board meeting is September 22nd at 9 a.m. Additional announcement is normally we would have our fall conference in September. WCA Fall Conference. I don't know if you've been notified yet or not. You've seen it in an email or, or received it in the mail. What they're going to do is the breakout sessions. I believe it's on Mondays, uh, starting in September through November 8th. Uh, we're authorizing you to attend those via Zoom. Uh, you can pay the regular meeting rate, so it would be $50 uh, for the meeting rate, and that would come out of your $2,000 you know, stipend for meetings, etc. So you are certainly welcome to do that and sign up for them. Uh, and you will be paid for it and to give us an all an opportunity to get some of those outreach programs for those concurrent sessions that they had uh, give you an opportunity to pick and choose and uh, get some additional information that's great mr chair sorry. yes um sorry i missed the just a oral committee report mm -hmm. uh, i did have since finance meeting there was a request to get an update on the community development background so I did have a meeting with a uh, DCEDC the administrator and we were presenting the information at the finance meeting on where that is, where that project is, where that grant money, and where we're at with that. So we continue. All right. Thank you. Yes, Just another reminder that if you haven't completed your evaluation of our administrator, don't forget to do that. Yes, I'm please. assuming. Mr. Lino, that we can put them in your mailbox? Yes, we are in the clerk's office. And they, they will go just direct to me. They will not go to anybody else. And you notice he's had really good behavior. The meeting for DM code is 825. Motion to adjourn. David, I have a quick question. Um, could an email be sent out uh, just giving a run through on how the WCA is going to be handled for the breakout sessions this year? Just a little clarification on, you know, what's offered and stuff like that. The simplest way is to go to the WCA website. Um, okay. I know they did mail this out. I received something about two weeks ago on it. Uh, and we can also uh, try and get an email of the breakout sessions and, and try and get that out to everybody, too. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Mr. Chairman, if I could just follow up on that question about the WCA. Sure. Um, 
You said they were going to be on Mondays. Is that throughout the day, or how does that conflict with our committee meetings that are on Mondays? And can those be later? Or so, yeah. Hopefully, that information is in the packet. Uh, I, I know typically the WCA will, will have it on a particular time, and it'll be a live situation. But then they always make it available later as a video. Um, for me, for me whether, whether you're able to do the, the actual online Zoom or whether you're able to watch uh, its in entirety at some other time, I'm okay with that as far as the of payment piece. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Thank you.